Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi. I've got a friend who thinks history's boring, and yet he loved the outlaw king. History is intriguing and it connects to the present. If you think the history of building societies is boring, I'd say you don't know. But if I asked you the oldest surviving building society, you would know it was Scottish. And you'd be right. So let's start the story here. This was once a Roman bathhouse in the Antonine Wall. The Romans didn't just bring baths to what we now call Scotland. They also brought the idea of mutual societies. The thing is, being in the Roman army could be a wee bit dangerous. Fighting Picts and Scots and stuff like that. Around 100 BC, there was a bloke called Gaius Marius. He was a Roman general who became consul. Fought Germanic tribes, Numidians, Teutons, you get the idea. Anyway, he reformed the legions and one of the things that he'd introduced was a burial club. You and your legionary pals chip in a regular saving and if in the course of the burnie looty subdue the locals grind of everyday life, you ended up dead, then there would be money to ensure a proper burial. Everyone puts in a little, folk get out bigger amounts from the common fund in a crisis. Many a meekle max a muckle. It seems obvious now, but at the time, it was revolutionary. Scrub my back, will ya? Scrub your own back? I'm not joining the Roman army, what about me? Now I'm glad you asked that. Revolutions happen throughout the centuries, but not all revolutions are violent. The Royal Mile here in Edinburgh feels like the beaten heart of the revolution that came with the Scottish Enlightenment. When Voltaire said, it's to Scotland that we look for our ideas of civilization. Adam Smith here built the foundations of modern economics. David Hume, just up the street, built the foundations of modern philosophy. The Hunterian Museum in Glasgow shows how William Hunter built the foundations of obstetrics. And it was his brother, John Hunter, he was the guy who first named teeth. Molars, pre-molars, bicuspids. Now that might not seem important, but this was a huge leap of imagination for a man living in a country where nobody actually had any teeth. We Scots are used to telling anyone who will listen about what the Scottish Enlightenment gave to the world in philosophy, medicine, engineering and economics. But to some extent, the Scottish Building Society was given to Edinburgh by Birmingham. In the white heat of Enlightenment thinking and Industrial Revolution, things were changing in the English industrial heartlands. There was a new class of skilled tradesmen emerging in steelworking and other crafts in the English Midlands. They had income, but not the kind of wealth that would allow them to own property. So they started to form clubs, a bit like the Roman soldiers had done hundreds of years before. These clubs were set up in the taverns and coffee shops of Hanoverian Britain. In fact, in 1775, just as colonists in the Americas were gearing up for a revolution, they'll come at a sticky end. A man called Richard Ketley, the landlord of the Golden Cross Inn in Birmingham, set up a club. Ketley's Building Society. It was the first ever building society in the world. Members of the club would save a regular amount and they would draw lots to see who would receive club funds to have land purchased and a house built for them. And then the next guy, and then the next member, and so on. When everyone had a house, then the club would be wound up. These were terminating building societies. The last of these terminating building societies wound up in 1980. Now you're probably thinking, 200 years is a long time to sit in the same pub waiting for a house. That guy definitely drew the short straw. But it wasn't the same club, or the same pub for that matter. Because soon there were hundreds of these clubs. In 1837, the last of the Hanoverian kings died and Queen Victoria came to the throne to replace him. And shortly after, somebody said, hold on, why don't we bring new members into our club to replace the people who leave? Somebody else said, that's a belting idea. And that's why the 1840s saw the beginning of permanent building societies. 
At the start of 1848, two things happened. The California gold rush saw people tumbling over each other in a dog-eat-dog, -dog, grab what you can individualism. And Karl Marx published the Communist Manifesto. Later that year, between these two extremes, the Edinburgh Friendly Property Investment Company was set up to provide a mutual company where people could borrow and save and over the longer term, own their own homes. This was much more revolutionary for the people of Edinburgh than you might realise. Think about it. A permanent, mutual shared society where folks could put in savings and borrow to buy property. And it was the people who saved and borrowed that owned the society. It's probably the kind of thing that the French would have loved in 1848 when they had their second revolution and put on the real life performance of Les Miserables. Ironic that the West End run of Les Mis lasted five times as long as the Second French Republic. If Victor Hugo was alive today, he'd probably have a savings account with Edinburgh Friendly Property Investment Company. <laughs> In 1929, they changed the name again to simply Scottish Building Society. That sounds good, doesn't it? The Scottish Building Society. Makes you feel kind of proud and warm inside, doesn't it? It was meant to. It was a reaction to the growth of English societies trying to expand into Scotland. You shall not pass! Set up during the international upheaval of the 1848 People's Spring, the Scottish Building Society went through Victoria's reign, industrial and imperial expansion, an explosion of friendly societies that are no longer with us, the Crimean War, the Boer War, the First World War, the stock market crash and Great Depression, English societies trying to muscle in, yet in the years of economic challenge in the 1930s, the Scottish Building Society doubled the value of its mortgage book. But here's what I found really interesting. The first board meeting of the newly named Scottish Building Society took place here at 73 Hanover Street North in Edinburgh. It's now a Mediterranean and Middle Eastern restaurant. Now that's not the interesting bit. What's really interesting to me is that mortgages were approved at that first meeting. Imagine if today your mortgage application had to go to a meeting of the board. Squeaky bum time or what? One of the loans that was approved at that first meeting was for a two bedroom flat here in Brougham Street, Toll Cross, and it cost £425. What? £425? That's less than I paid for my last telly. Yeah, I couldn't afford one of these flats today. The only way that I'm going to see inside is in one of those property programmes on my £425 telly. Here's the thing though, the guy that bought the flat was a barman. That's like a normal person like me. At the board meeting in May 1929, mortgages were awarded to a French teacher, a baker, an engineer, two sales reps, a gas worker, a bookkeeper and a compositor. Now I have no idea what a compositor does, but they sound like normal people. Over the previous hundred years, people had been rushing for gold, striving for communism, fighting a revolution so that people of normal means could have property. And all that time, they just needed to open an account with the Scottish Building Society. And here's a fantastic thing. It's still a club that you can join today. It continued through the Second World War, rationing, mergers, acquisitions, mods, rockers, hippies, flower power, glam rock, punk rock, inflation, monetary crisis, endowment mortgages, deregulation, the 2008 financial crisis, and most important of all, the demutualisation trend of building societies becoming banks in the 1990s. When every man and their dog wanted the sugar rush of demutualisation, the Scottish Building Society continued on, adapted and grew. But all the time has remained a membership organisation for folk that want to borrow and save with the only building society still based in Scotland.